watching us from Welcome to Mabuno Church Online. And I'd like to say Happy New Month. We're almost at the end of the year. November, the Lord has been faithful. We're about to praise this God of ours. So wherever you're at, please get up on your feet. If you're in your car, please engage with us in praise and in worship. We're about to celebrate a God who is deserving of all praise and all worship. Are you ready? ready. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, ready? I think they're ready. So let's go. <laughs> Put your hands together. Yeah. Oh.
Who know the reason we dance, the reason we shout, the reason we give our all from the bottom of our hearts is because God is worthy of every praise that we can give Him. Our God is a God of love and He's a God of grace. And when I say grace, let me give you a picture of grace. In our relationship with God, God is always the bigger person. Because you see, we are flawed, we are frail, we are weak, but our God is perfect. But this is the picture of the bigger person that I need you to see. That God doesn't leave us in our state. In fact, He works out salvation with His own arm for our behalf. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 puts it this way. God steps out of His perfection and says, Come, now let us settle the matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. This is the God we interact with. This is the God that we relate with. A God who did not leave us in our broken state, but has shown us love, grace, and mercy. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. As imperfect as we are, you show us your grace. You show us your mercy. You show us your love. We thank you for your grace, Lord. And we worship you for who you are. You are love, you are grace. And for somebody watching here today right now, reveal yourself to them. In whatever state they may be, we thank you, O oh God, that you are drawing us to yourself. Hallelujah. All these pieces, brokenness scattered, in mercy gathered, landed at home. Empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free. I've been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
we thank you that you're still in the business of redeeming and saving the lost. Thank you that if it wasn't for your love, we would be perished, we would be destroyed. But Lord, you chose and saw fit that you would draw us to you. Lord, I pray for everybody watching this broadcast right now, whether it's on TV or it's on YouTube, wherever it is they are. Anybody under the sound of my voice, I pray that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that they would feel your loving embrace. Lord, that you would remind each and every one of us that there is no situation that we can find ourselves in that is so far removed from your love and for your grace. Lord God Almighty, draw us to you. Lord, we lift you up in this place, in this church here and now, that you would draw men, women, and children to yourself, O oh God. Have your way. We are in all of your love. We're in all of your grace. We celebrate who you are. And we have prayed all of this, believing and trusting in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We love you, Mavuno. Stay tuned. We have more in store for you. God bless. Hey, greetings and happy new month. My name is Pastor Moredi or Pastor M. Uh, just welcoming you as you worship with us uh, in this new month of November. So excited that you're here. So excited that you're part of us. Hey, I want to just ask a favor right now. If you are watching from home, you're not watching this from your uh, physical location, uh, if you would use the link on the screen and just tell us where you're watching from. If one of you in the house, it doesn't have to be everybody that fills it, but whoever you're watching with, if just one of you could fill it out and we'll be able to just let us know where you're watching from and who you're with. Uh, why we're doing this, this is an exercise we've been doing for a little while. And what we're trying to do is just a recognition that not everybody is in our physical locations. Um, part of our congregation is watching out uh, in uh, virtually. And we want to make sure that you are plugged in. We want to make sure that you're part of the community and that we can serve you as your church, uh, even though you're not in a physical location right now. So just, if you could just stop right now, get one person to fill that form out, uh, use the link on the screen. We would be so excited and it would just help us know who you are. Uh, so, uh, really, really uh, excited about this new month. We're breaking into a new series. Uh, it's called Be or Become, and we are committed to becoming everything that God wants us to be. So we're going to be learning about that because I know you're committed to being everything that God wants you to be. And Pastor Angie uh, Kimaru is going to be taking us through that. She is a pastor, executive pastor at Mavuno Church uh, in charge of discipleship. But she is also uh, the pastor of Mavuno South, one of our thriving locations uh, right here in Nairobi. And so I'm, I can't wait to hear Pastor Angie. But before we do that, uh, I want to just encourage us. Um, this, is our, this is our time to give. And maybe let me just lead us into a time when we give and pray over our giving. And before we do, just mention a scripture that really stood out for me. And, and, and I'm really excited about it because one of the things that God has been doing in this season is just bringing a, a fresh surge of salvation. So many people have given their lives to Christ at Mavuno in the last few months. Just this week alone, over a hundred people gave their lives to Christ in Mavuno churches across the world. Isn't that exciting? And we believe it's just the beginning. And here's the thing. I really believe it's because of the faithful giving of this congregation that our teams are able to go out, that our churches are able to stand, and we're able to do God's work. This is a verse that really stood out for me, 2 Corinthians 9, 11. And it says this, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And here's what we're praying. We're praying that God would enrich us as a congregation so that we can fund and we can uh, resource the work of the kingdom. And many more people, I look forward to a time we'll be reporting a thousand people came to Christ at Mavuno uh, across the world. And even maybe more than that, uh, as we trust God together. Isn't that exciting? And for me, the, the biggest thing is some of those people will be my relatives. Some of those people will be your friends and the people that you work with. Amen. So let me just pray for us as we give and you can use the giving information on the screen uh, as you uh, commit and walk alongside us to resource this ministry. Father, I thank you for your people and I thank you so much that even as we start this new month, we know we started by your strength and by your grace alone. I thank you for the generosity of this family, for the many who've given over the years, for the way that you've used those resources to bring people to you to build your church. And I thank you for the over 100 people who, who said yes to Jesus over this last week alone. And Lord, we 
look forward to a time when even more will do the same. We think of all the marriages that are going to be saved, all the children that are going to be brought upright simply because of those decisions. And not, not, none of those is a coincidence. Every one of them called by you. And so we thank you for the privilege of being part of what you're doing on planet Earth. And I pray for your people that even as we give, Lord, I pray that you would enrich us in every way, so that we'll be generous on every occasion. And through us, glory and honor will come to the Father. And now even as we receive uh, your word, I pray that, Lord, you'd open our hearts. Open our hearts. Help us to hear your word. Help us to become the people you want us to be. For we ask all these things in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus and God's people said, Amen. Amen. Greetings, good people. My name is uh, Pastor Angela Kimaru, and I'm an executive pastor here at Mavuno. And I lead a beautiful, wonderful campus. I think it's the best campus, Mavuno South. And I'm so privileged to be bringing the Word of God uh, to you today and this month. We're actually starting a new series titled Be. Um, what does it mean? The question we're going to be asking is, what does it mean for us to be the church in the times that we're living in? Why should I believe? Why should I belong to a community um, when I can do church by myself? Why should I submit to a, a church process? Why should I be fearless? Now, guys, I don't have an authority to speak on behalf of all the churches in the world, but I have the authority to speak on behalf of Mavuna Church. And we are committed to being everything that God desires for us to be as Mavuno. And so this series is one we're going to reflect, self-reflect. We're going to um, examine ourselves and ask ourselves, who are we? Are we on the right path? We're going to remind ourselves of who God called us to be as Mavuno. And then we're going to ask ourselves, are we living this out? What must we do? What must our campuses do to become everything that God desires for us to be? And I'm really excited about this. There's a saying that, a famous saying in Kenya that says, Vitu kwa ground ni different. <laughs> Meaning that the reality on the ground is different. And it's important for us to acknowledge that there have been things that have happened or have been said by people in church that have caused so much pain and hurt to many. My hope and prayer is that during this series, it will cause us to experience healing. It re will remind us about what God desired the church to be, the body of the church as well as who God desired for us to be as Mavuno Church. And so to kick off uh, the series, I'm going to read something that I read from uh, a research uh, company called Banner Group, and they were researching why millennials don't go to church. They asked millennials, what do you think of church? Uh, what pushes you away? What draws you into church? And they asked them, when you visit a church, how do you want to be approached? Or what do you want to see when you visit that church? So the first thing uh, that shocked me as I read the research is that the results uh, showed that two out of 10 millennials, these are people who are aged 30 and under, uh, and they asked them, why do you think church is not relevant to you? And these guys said, two out of 10 millennials think that church is not important to their daily lives. Eight out of 10 people don't think that church is important anymore. 39% of them say that church is not important because they can find God elsewhere. 35% of them say that church is not personally relevant to them. I can't believe it. Church is not personally relevant to them. One in three simply find church boring. Gulp. <laughs> and one in five say uh, that they feel like God is missing from church. I can't believe you go to church and you say that. A significant amount of young adults have deeper complaints. The ones I said are not even deep enough. They're deeper complaints. Of that group, 35% of them say they have negative perceptions of church as a result of moral failures in church leadership. A substantial number of millennials who don't go to church say that when they go to church, they say that Christians are judgmental, Christians are hypocritical, Christians are insensitive to others. And when I read this, and when you hear about this, I don't actually blame people for not going to church. I don't blame people for not wanting to be a part of this community or part of this body called church. Why should I go to church when there's so much drama already in my life? Why should I go into a space where there's drama? But that's what we're going to discuss this whole month, and I'm excited about it. So what I want us to do is I want us to play a little game and do a little exercise. So if you're watching online, I want you to get on the chat, and I want you to comment if you have ever heard or thought about these statements, or if, if, maybe if you've ever had this thought in your mind. If you're watching with friends or family, I'm watching with friends and family today, and I want you to put up your hands if you've ever had, put up your hand right now. Everybody put up your hand is what I want you to do. If you're watching with friends or family, put up your hand 
hand. If you've ever had this thought, I want you to put down your hand. Sawa, sawa. Okay. So the first thing, if you've had this thought, church lasts too long. <laughs> church lasts too long. If you've had that thought, put down your hand. <laughs> Already, guys are putting down their hands. The, the line has gone down. Hands have gone down. If you have had fear of being judged, put down your hand. Church was way too boring. Church is full of cliques. They only want my money. I think in this space, there's only one person remaining, and things just got real. They only want my money. I've been hurt in church by a pastor. I don't trust my pastor. They don't even preach about Jesus. I don't like Christians, but I love God. <laughs> I don't feel closer to God after leaving church. Church is just one big show and nobody cares. They only care about the numbers. It feels like it's all about rules and regulations. You know what surprises me, is, doesn't surprise me, is in this room, everybody has put down their, ha their hands. Everybody has had this thought. And we are in the church. If you're watching this, you're participating in church, and these are the thoughts that are happening to us inside. The survey that I've been mentioning or where this study was done was done with over 100,000 people. And the above is actually what they said about church. This is what we say about the thing that God created. Those descriptions may be an experience that you went to, or maybe you're actually going through it right now. And I wanna tell you, I'm so sorry that you have felt that way. I'm so sorry that you've experienced pain and hurt in the thing that God created. I wanna say that God has a different plan for you. If you've come here or you stumble across this series thinking why church, why God, why should I be here this month, I wanna change the narrative and say, let's discover what God has to say about the church. And we're gonna talk about that right now. The very first time the word church appears in the Bible is in Matthew chapter 16 and then in verse 18. And Jesus is actually the one who first referred to this term. So he talks about the universal church and then he talks about the local community. So in chapter 18, uh, chapter uh, 16 of Matthew, which is the first time that it was used, he says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The rock here refers to a statement that Peter had made. Uh, Jesus asked him, who do people say that I am? And then Jesus said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus turned to him and said, on that bedrock, on that word, I will build my church. And the church has flourished for over 2000 years. Everyone who makes that the foundation of their life becomes a part of the family of God. And we love that. What I love is that Jesus says, I will build my church. And he was actually foretelling what was going to happen because he hadn't yet gone through death and resurrection. He was telling them that the power of the Holy Spirit is coming to empower you to experience God in a new way, the building of the church. And, it, and through the books of Acts, we see how the church started and how it flourished in the Bible. The second time it was used is when he was talking about um, how to deal with um, drama in the church because there's gonna be drama. And so he said, if you're having an issue with your brother, he says, first, take it up with him. If you feel the guy hasn't heard you, invite witnesses into that conversation. And then he said, if further still, you don't feel like you've been heard, take it to the church. He was talking about the local community, how it's important to be a part of a local community. The church is God's idea. Say amen, the church is God's? The church is God's idea. Sometimes when I want to describe my relationship with a church, I think I'd put as my status, it's complicated. Uh, and the reason I do that is because I love church. I love worship. I love the word. I love being with people. But sometimes where people are, there's drama. And so I'd say it's complicated. And the thing that disturbs me about the, the, the word of God sometimes and frustrates me is that when I look at the word, God uses few people uses men and women primarily to uh, pass on his message. Um, and so it's, you know, we all, the experiences of burning bush moments, there's uh, him, so he talked through a donkey, the ex there's experience of someone sitting with lions, uh, there's ex experience of him coming down through the mountain uh, and speaking to people. But then I don't know if I want to be the person in the room with some lions 
waiting to see if, if God is going to shut them out. I don't know if I want to enter the fire myself. Um, but then the truth is God uses men and women to pass on messages, few people. The Israelites, when God himself came down the mountain, there's a story that's told that when he came down the mountain, the people got so terrified. They told the Lord, you know what? It's okay. Eh? It's okay. You just talk to Moses, your guy. Yeah? He had you from the bush. We can't, we can't deal with it. And I'm like, I think that would also be my response sometimes. I'm like, there's too much drama. Being in the presence of God causes you to recognize how sinful you are. And so half the Bible, majority of the Bible, more than I think um, half, is God speaking through people, giving us the word, specific people. And so where are these people? This complexity. He uses broken people. He used people who have anger issues. He used men and uh, people who had issues with women. He used prostitutes. He used murderers. This is who God uses to pass on the message of God to us. And the, and the, the sermon or, or the part I want us to read is about an individual that I love, that Jesus had a conversation with him. I resonate with this guy very much just because of his character and who he was. And that's Simon Peter. He's the one who said uh, to Jesus, you are the son of the living God. He represents to me the kind of person that God sent to save. But at the same time, the kind of person that God uses to speak to us in the church. So who's Simon Peter? So Peter was one of the disciples. He was a fisherman. He was in business with his brother, Andrew. Uh, he was partners with James and John. But this guy, he was a fisherman. He was hardworking, got up very early in the morning to fish before dawn. Uh, but he was also rough on the edges. Um, the thing we need to know about Peter is that he was very strong-willed. He was enthusiastic enthusiastic, impulsive, and also brash at times. He was outspoken and passionate. In another way of putting it, as I put it, is that he had foot and mouth disease. That's why he reminds me of me. So this guy, uh, I want to give some examples of that. So this guy, um, when Jesus asked, you know, who do people say that I am? He's the only one out of all the disciples who said, you are the son of the living God. God is like, Jesus is like, ish. You know, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. Only the Lord revealed it to you. And Peter is like, yeah, that's right. Then Jesus goes on to tell them, in fact, I'm going to die on the cross for your sins. You guy, Peter rebuked Jesus. He told him, how dare you talk about death and crosses? Yeah, we don't do that. Jesus turns to him and is like, how dare you rebuke me? In fact, Jesus aligned him. I love Peter because he rebuked the Lord. I'm like, who has the courage to do that? On the last night of Jesus' life, they were having dinner and they were sharing supper together. And then Jesus warned them, this very night, you will fall away to me, from me. Peter, yeah, he had courage. He piped up and he said, Lord, even if all these others betray you, me, me, never. I ain't. I love you. And I love him because he's like, you got to love it. This guy was all in. In fact, uh, Peter even said, uh, Jesus, you know, corrected him and said, Peter, tonight, before the, the, the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter was legitimately horrified. He was like, Lord, I will never, never, never disown you. Even if I have to die, me. Never. This guy was sincere. He meant every word. That's what I believe. In fact, that night, that very night when Jesus was praying and all of them fell asleep, the disciples fell asleep, they woke up and, you know, there was a fracas because guys had come to arrest Jesus. Peter pulls out a knife and in an attempt to strike a death blow, he cuts out someone's ear. The guy was committed. He was all in. But unfortunately, this guy overestimated his strength. Peter was a bundle of contradictions, and that's who I am. On one hand, he's alone, he's, he's, he's courageous. He alone is courageous enough to follow Jesus all the way into the high priest courtyard. On the other hand, his courage failed him when he was confronted and faced with the possibility of being arrested. On the one hand, he sincerely promises total devotion to death if necessary. But on the other hand, he disowns Jesus at the first sign of danger and his response is to run and cry. But you guys, his tears tell us something about him. It's, it shows us his earnest response is that his heart broken about his failure, but he's still passionate about God. He is tormented by his failures. And it leads us to the scripture I want us to read today, which is from John chapter 21. Let's read it together. It says, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. After what? After Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus has started showing up to people. Uh, Jesus has been resurrected, and he's been showing up to his disciples everywhere. Even after Jesus' resurrection, Peter's failure 
plagued him. So the excitement is there. He's back from the grave. This confusion uh, in that he's not kind of telling them everything. He's showing up, you know, just hilarious, showing up, uh, you know, when in the room and terrifying them because he appears like a ghost. You know, he shows up when they're walking on the road. Jesus was just appearing to the disciples. But what I love is he spoke to the women who had gone to the graveside and he tells them, go to the disciples and Peter. Tell them to go to Galilee. Did you guys hear that? He said... Go tell the disciples and Peter. And I think the emphasis was because he knew that Peter was tormented. Maybe Peter would not have gone. Peter was caught up in his pain after rejecting him. And he was wondering, would, would Jesus really want me? Would Jesus want a colossal loser like me to still come and be in his presence? This is what it says in verse 2. It says it happened this way. Peter uh, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. He said, I'm going out for, uh, to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So because, um, you know, they've been waiting for Jesus in Galilee because that's the word that had come up. And so they go there, nothing is happening, and the guy decides, I'm going fishing. He tells the guys, I'm going fishing. And I want you to understand the context that this happened with. It's like when Jordan had, uh, you know, dis done some discovery with baseball. Do you guys remember that? Then he called a press conference and said, guys, I'm going back. I'm going to play basketball. That's actually what he said. I'm going to play basketball. Nobody asked him, do you mean you're going to play basketball after service with your kids? Nobody asked him, does it mean you're just calling your boys to play basketball? What is this press con conference for? They knew it meant he was going back to play basketball. So when he uh, said, when, when uh, Peter said, I'm going fishing, everybody knew what he meant. Everyone understood what that statement meant. They knew that he was saying, I'm not going for a recreational field trip, a few hours out on the water to kill some time. Scripture says they fished all night. Peter was going back to his old job. This was Peter giving up on being a disciple. This moment captures for me how we are pinball between busyness and distraction. We go back to what we know, old habits, old patterns, rhythms to distract ourselves from the reality and the pain that we're facing. It's a way to block out the pain. It's a way to silence the voice of condemnation or rejection in our head. Peter says, I don't know how to deal with what's going on in my life. I'm gonna go back to what I know and what I know is fishing. He says, I'm gonna take a step away from this. I'm gonna step away from what God has planned for me. I'm gonna go fishing because that I know, that I can deal with. Listen to what the Bible says. It says that six other disciples says, we're going, said we're going with you. Peter, even in his defeated and courage state, was still a leader. I love it. He took six guys back to the old life with him. They fished all night and they caught nothing. Let's go back to the scripture. It says, early in the morning, Jesus arrived on the shore. They didn't know it was him. So he called out, friends, do you have any fish? Maybe they thought it was a fishmonger looking for fresh fish for the market. So they shouted back, no. The suggestion I love is that Jesus was saying, the way you're living life, it isn't working, eh? Peter. So he tells them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll file some. And they're like, why not? They have nothing to lose. They've been fishing all night. So they did that and their nets were so full that they struggled to haul it back to the, um, onto the boat. Now this is, moment is significant because it reminds us of what happened three years ago. And that's when Peter and Jesus met. What happened is that Peter, Andrew and his business partners, partners they were cleaning their nets after a night of fishing and they had caught nothing. Jesus, uh, sorry, Jesus was, was, was preaching by the shore and people you know, began coming. Crowds kept coming up to him. And so he asked Simon, who was washing the nets, says, can I borrow your boat? Um, let's, let's, you know, push it out a little into the shore so that I can talk to the people. And so Jesus taught from his boat. After he was done, he turns to Peter and he says, dude, let's go fishing. He's like, let's pull out to deep waters and let's, let's catch some fish. Peter looks at his partners. He's like, dude, it's been a long night. Probably rolled his eyes and says, but you know what? Uh, who am I? I'm just a professional fisherman and you are a teacher of a word. Um, but you know what? Let's go, let's go catch some fish. So he nodded and they went off to catch fish. Still nothing. I can see Jesus, maybe with a toothpick in my mind, enjoying the breeze on the boat. Then he turns to him and says, why don't you try the other side? 
I mean, you can see Simon rolling his eyes. He's like, really, this is your professional contribution to this, the other side. But anyway, the guy does it. Maybe out of frustration, he's like, ah, let me just do it. And so he lets his net down on the other side. And then the, the, the catch is so huge that the nets begin to tear. So he calls over John uh, and James and say, come help me, because the fish were so many that it actually filled two boats and the boats began to sink. At this point, Simon had never experienced a net tearing boat sinking catch like this. And suddenly he realized why God has just stepped onto his boat. He dropped to his knees and he says, Lord, you should leave. I'm too much of a sinner for you to be around. Simon recognized that he was in the presence of somebody holy. And he says, you're holy, I'm not. Jesus re responds. I love how Jesus responds. He turns to him and says, I came for you. I've come to interrupt your day. He says, I came for you. Jesus radically changed Peter's story. Instead of catching fish for dinner, he's going to catch people for God. When they got back to shore, all four men, listen to this, all four men abandoned their boats and their nets and began following Jesus. The, the, the miraculous catch reminded them of what Jesus wanted to do with Peter's life. He says, I want to catch, I want you to catch people. And so Peter, uh, in, in, we know this later on in scripture, he caught a lot of people for God. The rest of his life was devoted to helping find, people find and follow Jesus. Let's go back to the chapter we, we're reading. And so they've been fishing all night. Uh, and then they hear the instruction, try the other side. And John was actually the first to recognize that it was Jesus because Jesus has been appearing to people. And they say, it's the Lord. He turns to John, Peter and tells him, it's the Lord. And you know, Peter, as soon as he heard this, because he's impulsive, he jumped into the water, took off. This guy is a bundle of contradictions. He's the one who has led the desertion of guys, you know, onto the boat. Now he's abandoning them and running back to Jesus. I mean, the guys in the boat are like, dude, dude. Because at this point, the boat has, you know, now the fish are many. And they're like, boss, you could have waited even. Because it's just a hundred yards from shore. I love it. In fact, I think Mark left it because he was like, Peter, it's just too much drama. This guy is so dramatic. We're just a hundred yards from shore. You could have helped us, Bana. You could have helped us. But anyway, I love the Bible. And so he gets onto the beach and he meets Jesus there, burning coals of fire. He says, come have breakfast with me. He tells him, go get the fish. Let's have breakfast. And, uh, you know, the disciples come and they're enjoying breakfast. And it says they'll talk, but no one is saying anything. Why? It's the Lord, number one. They know it's him. They've been, they've been caught red-handed back at their original job. So breakfast is silent. Everybody's stuffing their face quiet. Um, John, who was elated and excited, jumped off the boat fast, comes and sees burning coals, and he sees Jesus. And the last time he was by burning coals, it was when he denied Jesus three times. And so he couldn't speak. He was silent. He was excited, but silent. And the silence was broken by Jesus. This is what it says. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. At that time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him at that time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus asked him three times and each time he remembered uh, the rooster crowing. Each time he remembered how he had let Jesus die, uh, down. What I love is that Jesus used all names of, uh, of this guy. He said, uh, Simon, son of John. Do you guys remember when your mother would use that name on you? Angela Wanja Wagatama. In Peter she used it with Kikuyu. Angela Wanja Wagatama. I'm like, I would stand at attention because I'm like, what she's telling me is life and death. So at this point, he knew Jesus was asking him a serious thing. Do you love me more than these? Maybe he was pointing at the fish or pointing at the disciples or pointing at the boat and saying, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than the pain um, that happened to you in the past? Do you love me more than your old life? Do you love me enough to let go and trust me? Do you love me? He says, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. 
the first reaction is to be, was Jesus being mean? But you guys, I actually don't think so. When you look at the scripture further, Jesus takes him back to when they first met. Jesus takes him back to the moment of his greatest pain. You see, he takes him back to where he met and says, the invitation is still open, come. The invitation is still open to you. And then he takes him back to this point of pain, the moment of calls, and he says, this moment will no longer define you. Instead, burning calls will remind you of your greatest redemption. He instructs him and tells him, feed my sheep. He tells him, take care of my sheep. It will break, bring back for Peter now emotions of love, acceptance, and purpose every time he looks at burning uh, coals. So this is what I want to tell you, church. Don't let the failures or the pain of the past determine your future. I love that God uses broken people. God uses broken Peter to preach the first message of Pentecost. And 3,000 people came to church. God used a rough, outspoken guy to start the church. Listen, guys, Peter cut off someone's ear. I love it. And maybe that guy was listening to that first sermon when he cut off the, the guy's ears. This guy abandoned his friends after leading them back to their own life. And he, was, he ran off back to Jesus. Maybe you're listening to this sermon and you're, you're thinking of someone in the church that hurt you. Someone who, who hurt you with their words or with their actions. But Jesus is saying to you today, don't let the past hold you back. Don't let what that person, don't let what that situation, don't let what that leader or that person said to you determine your future. I love what Jesus does next. In my mind, when Jesus was asking him, do you love me? By the last time they were standing. And Peter says, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then Jesus turns to him and says, follow me. And they start walking away. Now, this is what Peter does. Peter looks back uh, and looks at John. He looks back at his pal. He's like, what about John? <clears throat> but this is what Jesus says to him. He says, follow me. Leave that guy. Follow me. I'll deal with him. Follow me. I'm talking to you about your situation and the person that hurt you or something that happened to you. What God is saying is, forget that. Follow me. I'll deal with them. I'm the God of the universe. I'll deal with them as I see fit. God shuts him down and says, I want you, I want you to lean in. I want you to believe in me. I want you to follow me. And this is the action that Jesus wants for us. Many of us have church wounds. I want to acknowledge that. In fact, I want to apologize on behalf of the leaders that hurt you or the people that hurt you. But Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. He wants you to believe and then he wants you to lean in. I love this moment. He wants this moment to be like what it was for Peter and he wants it for you. He wants you to turn in. He wants you to lean in and say, I'm going to follow. You see, people, God, people, God uses broken people. As your pastors, we are broken men and women. In fact, I think God uses us because we are even more broken. And even if we hurt you, even if we wronged you, what God wants to do is he has a bigger plan for you. God wants uh, us to move into his original plan, which is to be fishers of men, to be fearless, to be who God wants us to be. This, this, this church, what we are committed to being is to being a church with real people, uh, with real issues, where we meet a real God. So don't let the pain of, of the past determine your future. And so this is my ask of you today. I want you to commit to engage at Mavono. I want you to commit to be a part of this community. Whether you're watching online or you're, you're in a local campus, I want you to engage in community. In fact, if you're watching us online or watching on Switch TV, I want you to lean in. I want you to post, uh, follow the link that has been shared about watching Church at Home and tell us that you're watching. Tell us that you're part of this community. Tell us that you're part of this community. I want to invite us into a place uh, of prayer. God uses broken people. God uses broken people. Mm, you waited up for me Because you never sleep 
can never slumber I'm healing as we speak Cause you specialize in shattered dreams And I love the way you embrace broken people like want to pray for someone here who has been hurt by the church, someone who has been wounded. Father, thank you for reminding us that church is your idea <laughs> and that you use broken people. I thank you so much for walking into our day today and reminding us that, that the invitation is still open and that nothing and no one can stand of what you have planned for us if only we willingly follow. And so Father, I pray for that person. I pray that you would walk into their hearts and bring healing and transformation. I wanna pray that you would make a decision today to follow him and turn back to him. Turn back to him. The invitation is open. We release the pain. We cancel the voice of the enemy that says that we are not good enough. And like Peter, we're running back to you. We're jumping off the boat to be with you. And thank you for redefining us. We accept your love. We accept your healing today because you use broken people like us. Broken people like us. Thank you, Jesus. I wanna pray for you as you reconnect with your church. And I wanna speak a, a, a word to you. This is what it says in Psalms 92. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like the cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. And they will flourish in the courts of our God. I pray that you would be planted in the house of the Lord yes. today. I pray that you would stand in your church. Commit to being a part of the community. Father, forgive us for running away. Forgive us for choosing to make those moments determine our future. But we want to be planted in your house. We want to flourish as your children. And so I speak this word over that person that is choosing to be planted and choosing to flourish. That Father, you would allow them to connect, that you'd give them courage and boldness to connect with us as Mavuno and say, I want to connect, to approach their pastor and say, I want to connect with you right now. And so Father, I thank you because you use broken people. I thank you because our stories will be like that of Peter, where you have brought healing, love, and repentance and acceptance. And so I pray for boldness for us to walk in obedience. We praise you and we thank you, for it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Broken people like me. I love the way we'll never forsake broken people like me.